as i mentioned last time i wanted to describe the notion of a random access file and particularly binary files we have seen sequential files how to read and write to them but in larger problems where you have to handle a very large amount of data organized in the form of records such as the one which you are handling for projects for example it could be any other type of data it could be records representing bank accounts balances and so on it could be records describing employees and their salaries and other things it could be records describing inventory for example the number of parts which are stored by manufacturing companies and the, the amount stored and so on so you do require to handle very large amount of data not all of which can fit into the computer's memory also when you want to frequently change the contents of such files it is not easy to do so if you could read and write files only sequentially and that is the main reason why we need random access files so first i will describe the binary files and then we shall see the notion of random access in the files why it is necessary and then we will find out how we can actually open a file read any arbitrary portion of that file the rewrite that portion in place as long as the number of bytes that we write is exactly equal to the number of bytes that you had read originally in this case even if you have millions and millions of records on the disk which cannot all be put inside computer's memory you could actually pinpoint a specific record read it out change it and rewrite it in place so almost like updating an array in memory you can treat the records as if it's an array of records on the disk first the notion of binary files now text files is what we have ordinarily seen whenever we use c in and c out you interact with the machine through keyboard and through monitor what you see on the monitor typically text files text information so symbols which are graphically representable which can be seen and understood not all information can be represented symbolically like this for example the fingerprint files they contain binary data gray scale data one byte per pixel and the value stored is anywhere between 0 to 255 which does not represent a printable symbol it just represents a value of the picture color at that particular position in gray scale Similarly, you could have digital photographs, digital audio, video files. Why go that far? Consider the internal representation of some of the data values that we handle. Int, for example, when we say integer, we have seen earlier that integers could be represented internally in a binary format, which could be signed or unsigned. Similarly, fractional numbers could be represented in a floating point format. Now, if you have a four-byte area of memory in which the different bits are interpreted differently some can mean mantisa some can mean exponent etc there is no way by reading the bits you can immediately understand any printable symbol so this is non printable information what you do is you type in a value in a decimal notation in a character form the machine converts it the c in function the stream converts it into internal format similarly when you say see out the internal format is converted into text form and you get to see the details now that is all right as far as human interaction is concerned but is it necessary to store such values even on disk the point is the amount of storage that you may require could become very large could become very excessive take for example very large integer numbers a 4 byte integer can store uh, can store what largest value using 4 bytes 4 bytes is 32 bits so even if you leave one bit for sign a signed integer will be always the largest value with 2 to the power 
थर्टी वन माइनस वन नाउ दिस वेरी लार्ज वैल्यू टेन इलेवन डिजिट इफ यू स्टोर ए सिग्नल डिजिट एज इन एस की कोड देन ईच डिजिट टेक्स वन बाइट सो वेरी लार्ज वैल्यूज वुड रिक्वायर टेन इलेवन बाइट्स टू स्टोर ऑन दी अदर हैंड इंटरनल रिप्रेजेंटेशन इज क्वाइट इकोनॉमिक ग्रे स्केल वैल्यूज ए सिंगल बाइट कैन स्टोर ए वैल्यू बिटवीन जीरो टू टू फिफ्टी फाइव बट इफ मोस्ट ऑफ द वैल्यूज इन यूर फिंगरप्रिंट इमेज वेर हंड्रेड ट्वेंटी हंड्रेड फोर्टी हंड्रेड सेवेंटी इच वन रिक्वायर यू थ्री डेसिमल डिजिट्स एंड इफ यू वेर टू रिप्रेजेंट दम यू रिक्वायर थ्री कैरेक्टर्स दैट इज द रीजन वाई यूर डॉट एक्सपी एंड फाइव बिकम सो लार्ज You would generally store these things as binary compact images. Essentially, then you tend to use binary storage even on disk, not just inside computer's memory. Whenever you want to conserve space, ordinarily when you work with PCs in the labs or at your home on the laptops, and the kind of problems that you solve, it is not very apparent to you why do we need to conserve space. But imagine you are dealing with Millions upon millions of records. Each record is not 20 bytes or 30 bytes or 40 bytes, but could be 5,000 bytes, 10,000 bytes. And then suddenly you realize that you need to conserve space, not necessarily because space is costly. It's not the only reason, but because larger the amount of information that you have to read and write from the disk, the longer it will take. For your computer program to process that kind of data, so even from a performance point of view, it makes sense to store minimal amount of information on disk. This is the reason why you would like to use binary files. Now, if you have binary files, it is not necessary that all information within a record of the file should be completely binary. A fingerprint, of course, would be a completely binary file, but it is possible, for example. I have a record comprising a few bytes. First few bytes may be, let's say, my name. So this is one, two, three, four, five, six bytes. Now, if I want to store a numerical information, such as my date of birth, which is not stored in two digits for date, two digits for month. And four digits for year, amounting to eight bytes. It can be stored as a four-byte number or even a smaller number. In this case, the next four bytes will contain something which may be called a date of birth, but it might be a fixed-point number, for example. There could be my salary next. And the salary could be another four-byte number, which could be a fourteen-point number. Then there will be my address, which may again have printable characters such as A, fifteen, whatever. So you see, it is possible to mix text information with internal binary representation of some other information and. Create a composite record. It is precisely these kind of records that we often deal with in computer files, and it is important for us to understand how exactly we can read or write such records. The random access portion we shall come to in a moment, but the point I am making is even the structured records of useful information may be stored in binary form. Now, such files will have to be declared and processed as binary files. So, there is an additional prescription that is required when you define such file. Although some of the data may be textual format, overall the file contains non-text information, and therefore you declare the whole file as binary file. Binary file can, of course, contain text data as well. So, how do you handle? How do you define such files? How do you read and write such files? From a random access perspective, it is useful to have records which are of fixed size. If you take digital photographs, for example, which you want to store along with a person's individual information, if the photographs are of different size, each individual record will have a different size. 
it is not conducive for random access to such records to have differing size records. So what you do is you freeze a record size saying this is the maximum information that can be tagged for one individual or one item or one entity of a set. In some cases the information may be small, in some cases the information may be more, but maximum is this much. Then you define that as a record size. And once you define that as record size, then you, you may say, in this file, I might have one million records. Each record is exactly 2,534 bytes long, or 5,720 bytes long, or 48 bytes long, or 38 bytes long, whatever, a fixed size record. It is in this context that it will be useful to relook at the files that are organized on the disk. A file on the disk is essentially a stream of bytes. As you have already read, a file may contain very large number, a, a disk may contain very large number of files. In fact, as you are all aware, disk is organized into various directories and subdirectories, and within a directory or subdirectory, you will have multiple files. What we are looking at is the constitution of an individual file. So as far as we are concerned as programmers, a file is referred to by what we call a file pointer, typically noted as FP, but it could be any name. So when you say my file or student data file or whatever, the names that you use in your program are nothing but file pointers. These names, when you open a file, you associate a particular specific file on the disk with your name. And that name is nothing but a file pointer. So once you open a file, you have a file pointer. It is also called a handle, a file handle. Now once you have a file handle, the entire file contents can be treated merely as sequence of bytes. And that is what is the most important way of looking at it. That's why we call it a stream of bytes. So first byte, second byte, third byte, fourth byte, fifth byte, sixth byte, etc., etc. 20 billion bytes, doesn't matter. A file can be as large as 20 gigabytes, could be as small as few bytes, whatever. The entire file is nothing but a series of bytes. The easiest way to conceptualize this is to consider the disk to be an array of bytes. An array whose size is equal to size of the file. The way you access this file, therefore, should logically be that if you are given a particular position, say a value of POS, POS, then wherever that POS points to, that element of the array should be the content of that file. So if POS is zero, traditionally zero is the first position in any array. If POS is zero, you are pointing to character M. POS is one, you are pointing to character I. If POS is 38, you are pointing somewhere here. What you have somewhere here may not be an individual character. For example, if you are in the middle of a 4-byte integer number, then this byte alone, you may not be able to make any sense out of it. It is for this reason that you ought to know how are the records within the file structured. So there are two ways in which you look at the file. One, the logical way as per the definition of records that you have given in your program. So you say first I have the name of the person, then I have the whole number of the person, then I have the hostel number of the person, then I have marks in quiz, whatever, whatever. That is one way of looking at it. That's the logical way. The way operating system handles files is merely as a sequence of bytes. Consequently, the operating system has the provision to read or write any byte in the file. So you can arbitrarily read 5434th byte of the file. You can arbitrarily read 28 bytes starting from any position. Consequently, the most important aspect for physical reading and writing of the file become one, the file pointer, two, the current position, and three, the number of bytes. And therefore it is the easiest way to remember is that any file that you have, you open the file,
by prescribing the file pointer, you maintain a current position to the file and at that position you can read or write any number of bytes. And presto, you have complete control over how the file is to be handled. If the file contents are not visible as text, automatically the file is a binary file. The point is, when you read individual bytes, you must know exactly what that byte contains so that you interpret it properly. So if, for example, at some arbitrary position, if four bytes around that position together represent a binary number, then it is stupid for you to read just one byte and try to interpret it. You must read all of these four bytes and you must allocate the contents of these four bytes to an integer number which is having an internal representation exactly similar to what you had written there. And then let your computer program interpret that integer number into whatever value it has for which you have programming constructs available. So this is the point that I would like you to remember. When you have records, and we could have records of a fixed size, we shall see that. I am extending the same problem that we discussed last time, namely creating a database of students' records. I have modified the student info.h a bit. So we had character name, 31 characters. So 30 character name followed by backslash zero. Then we had role, which was a character thing. Now I am saying integer hostel. Then I am saying float marks five. So there are, let's say some teacher decides that there shall be five evaluations and there will be five different marks. Test one, test two, test three, test four, test five. And finally there is a character grade, two character grade A, A, B, etc. Observe that of all these, the first, second and the fifth components are actually printable character components. All in between that you have are integer numbers and five floating point numbers. Assuming that integer takes two or four bytes, the total number of bytes that will be required to represent this totality of information will be how much? Can you count? 31 plus 9, 40. 40 plus 5 into how many? Each floating point number is four bytes. So 5 into 4, 20 bytes. You have 40 bytes here, you have 20 bytes here, so you have 60 bytes. A character grade 3, 3 bytes. So 63 bytes. Integer hostel, let's say 4 bytes. So how many bytes totally you get? Well, the problem is you will not get the number by simple counting like this. Because whenever you define a structure, the way the computer allocates memory internally could be different from a simple juxtaposition of the number count, count of bytes. For that purpose, whenever you define structures or composite compound entities together like this in a struct, just as you can find out the size of a cal or size of int or size of float, you can find out size of a struct as well. So if that size comes to say 67 bytes, then the total structure will be equal to 67 bytes. If you wrote this structure as is by assigning values to different components and wrote the whole structure on the disk, it will occupy as many bytes as is given by the size of that struct. So for the purposes of our discussion, I have modified the student info structure to contain character elements as well as integer floating point and other elements. I am now creating a binary file out of the data that we had seen last time, I shall, we, shall, we shall look at that text data. Basically, we had input roll number, uh, I think name, roll number, and hostel. For the purposes of initialization for this file of students' records, I am putting all marks as zero and grade as star star. Because at the beginning of the semester, no marks are there, no grade is there. So this is the print student function. You are already familiar with this, this is from the last time. All that I have added is that for int i equal to 0 to 4, I am printing s dot marks i and I am also printing s dot grade. The main program is, 
I have the student list as well. Observe that in this particular case, I have the luxury of assigning a complete array to contain information for all students. But if the number of students was not 100, but let's say 2 million or 5 million, I would not be able to assign an array of this kind. And I will have to read and handle individual records from the list. I have a few additional things here. Rec size is the record size. So what is the record size? Let's go back a couple of uh, slides here. This structure, whatever is the size of this structure, is going to be record for one student. So as many students I have, so many records will be there on the file. And therefore I have an integer numeric variable which calculates the rec size here. The way I define the file, I can use a uh, file stream FIN, for example, input file stream. I define this to be fill.open. I give the name of the file as usual, but I now prescribe IO state as in. That is, it's an input file. If I said out, it would be an output file. Uh, I'm sorry, there's, there's one more mistake. Oh, yeah, this is the batch file. So this is the input file in which I have typed in uh, name, roll number, and hostel. All that is text information, so this is not a binary file. This is the input file. I define S to be of type student info, and now I calculate size of S. This is a built-in function. This will give me in bytes the total size that is internally allocated by the C++ compiler to the structure S. And that I am capturing in X size. Now this is again similar to what we saw last time. For We first read the value of N, the number of students that I have. And then for 1 to N, I keep reading the records, S.name, S.role, S.hostel. As I mentioned at the beginning, I arbitrarily set marks to 0 for all the tests. And I arbitrarily stay set grade to star star, where the grade does not exist at the beginning. And incidentally, I print students, I added one more parameter, a serial number. This i is the serial number, i is varying from 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, etc., etc. This serial number I propose to treat as the key to the student. Why this serial number? Because this serial number implicitly gives me an index into array of records on the desk. Let's go back to this. So if this is the zeroth position, and if the record of one student is equal to rec size, let's say 68 bytes, then where will be the next record? The next record will start at 69th byte, or 68th byte. So if 68 byte is the length of the record, every 68 bytes I will get the second student, third student, fourth student. Correspondingly, if I have a student number as the key, it is the easiest way for me to get the particular record given the number. So you just say, give me the record of 243rd student. I simply multiply 242 by the record size, and that takes me to the beginning of that record. I am just saying that data has been read from the batch file. Now I will create an output find binary database file. The size of each record for my uh, information, I am just printing it out. And this is the way you create the binary file. So observe that I have a DB file pass or the database file position, just like pass. Please note that putting pass or DB file pass or such values as mere integers will not be adequate. Why? Because the number of bytes that you can have on the disk are very large. Four byte integer is not adequate, so you always define it as a long length. So you typically have eight bytes to in the particular byte count. Now I'm creating an output file stream called my file. I'm also opening it in the same statement. So I have student db.bin. Bin is an arbitrary extension I'm giving to indicate that it's a binary file. Also now, that IO status is set to be out, so I am creating an output file. Second, I am also saying that it is a binary file. So this statement opens a file for writing and it says that the file will be, file contents will be binary. Of course, part of it could be textual, but that is incidental. Now look at how, what I do, very simple. 
for i equal to 0 to n and minus 1 basically I just capture from the student list i th element into my structure s and I simply write now this is a complex write basically what I am writing I am writing s the way I write s which is the structure to understand that what you write is actually number of bytes that is record size at which position do you write at the current position every time you execute a write statement the file pointer is automatically moved so many bytes further so consequently if you sequentially write a file like this the position will keep moving forward and forward and forward and you will keep writing successive records one after another this is a peculiar casting you remember we agreed on a type cast so you can say int or throw in brackets and you could cast a particular thing into a different type normally such type casting has to be compatible for example, you can cast int into a float, a numeric quantity into a numeric quantity. You can cast a character string into a character pointer because the first uh, character of that. Generally, when you talk about files, it really is not worried about what contents it is going to write, but it expects a character pointer and the number of characters to be written. And that is why if your original entity which you are writing is not a character string. In this case, obviously, S is not a character string. It is a structure. So this is an artificial way of C++ uh, of, of our telling C++ that look, whatever is the structure, please convert that pointer to that thing as a constant cal star type. That is a character pointer. So this is called the reinterpret underscore cast. This is a special function in C++. In ordinary C programming, you would not, not require this kind of thing, but this is standard practice in C++. So even if you don't understand it, you can blindly write this, followed by the and S, which is the structure that you want to write. What is important is the rake size. As many rake sizes will be written, as many times you execute this statement. So n records will get written, and finally, you should close this file. I forgot to close this file, and you return. That's the end of this. Here is the input data in a batch file. So I have six students, same I have just modified some numbers and names, whatever. This data goes in, this is a textual data. But once I put 0, 0, 0 for marks and all, I have floating point in integer numbers, etc. If I look at the contents of the file, I can't, I can't see them on the screen. Okay, I can't see them using gedit because the contents are not editable, they are not text uh, contents. So I use a special program called octal dump or hexadecimal dump. OD minus XA will give you a hexadecimal dump of the file student db dot bin. When you type it to less, you will get a few lines at a time. What I have shown here is just one line. This 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0 means first position. 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 2, 0. This, what would it mean? How many bytes? You are not talking decimal now. So you are talking either octal or hexadecimal. But these are the sequential bytes. Now you observe that M I L I N D million is a text name that you have given. But the name has been declared to be 31 characters long. What you have is a null terminated string here. All other characters here are bunkum. They don't mean anything. Whatever was there in the computer's memory got written here. But while interpreting, you are not going to interpret any one of these bytes where the first backslash zero that you find will terminate your string. So you can interpret it properly. However, if you look at other values here, for example, these values are not text zeros. They are binary zeros for integer. So in general, you will not be able to interpret anything by looking at the bytes. You have to write a program to understand, to read these and interpret them. Now comes the crucial question, can I update the file arbitrarily a single record? For example, suppose, let's say, two students, say one student's marks in test 3 have to be modified, another student's marks in test 1 have to be modified. Presume that over the semester, the marks have been filled up 
for test 1, test 2, test 3, test 4. The procedure will be exactly the same as we shall see in this particular thing. The question here is, just like you wrote a query language processor, here the query is very simple. Given a particular test number and marks and the student serial number, can I in the file change for the student marks in that particular test which I have prescribed? If I can directly do that, then I have a random access capability. That is what is being demonstrated by this program. So as usual, I have test marks as float and test NO as integer. Serial number is the key. So serial number 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, or 7, 8, etc. refers to student number. Please remember this is artificial. The actual key to a student which is unique is actually a roll number which has been allocated. However, you cannot translate roll number into a position on the desk very easily. So we are creating this artificial key called 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Later on I shall explain why that is even meaningful. So if I give some serial number and if I give a test number and test marks, the issue is can I update the record in place? Notice how I open this file. I neither say IF nor say OF. It is not an input file, it is not an output file. It is a file which is open for both input and output. So I simply define it as F stream. The file name is same student db.bin, but here I say IOS is in and IOS is out as well. And of course, additionally, IOS is binary. So it's a binary file from which I will both read and write. I have to be careful when I read and when I write. Please note that I can have a pointer for reading, a pointer for writing, and unless I am very careful, I might read from somewhere and write somewhere else. The basic capability I forgot to mention is not actually read and write. The basic capability is get character and put character. Of course, you have to mention file. So let's say if your file pointer is fp, you will say fp.getc or fp.putc. This is the basic characteristic. So at the position, you read a character, or at a given position, you write a character. That is the fundamental capability that operating system has, and it permits you to do exactly the same thing at the level of C or C++ program. Where do you get and where do you put is generally decided by the pointer. So you have to actually tell the operating system that in my file, <coughs> I want to read or write at a specific position. Please seek that position for me. Since for reading, I use get, the corresponding nomenclature used is called seek g. Since for writing, I use put, the normal nomenclature used for a pointer position for writing is called seek p. So seek p and seek g are the functions which are available associated with any file by which you can give a particular pointer value and ask the file to go to that particular position directly. From that position, either you can read or you can write. The example given here will illustrate that. So this is my file. And I use it for input or and output. I just say give a key value for student. I read the serial number. Now I ask for test number and test marks to be updated. I read in the test number and test marks. Please note that while I type the test marks, I will type them in text. But they will get converted into floating point because internally the text marks are defined as floating point. Internally, test number is defined as integer, etc. How do I read a student's record based on the serial number? Very simple. I know where I have to go. The 0th student starts at the 0th byte. The next student starts at the record size byte. The next student starts at 2 into record size byte, etc. So I simply multiply SNO by rec size and I get the DB file position. So if I want this particular student's record to be either read or written, it should be read or written at this particular position. Then I use the seek g function. Because I want to read, I want to get. I don't want to get a single character. I want to get 
multiple characters for which you use the function read. If you say get, you will get one character. If you say read, you will get more characters. But before that, you have to set the position pointer. So when you say my file dot seek g db file pause, operating system internally will move a logical pointer to that db pause. And it will say, all right, I'm ready to read one or more characters at this point. Later on, when you issue a read command, in exactly the same way, reinterpret cast cast star and give the rec size. It will read so many bytes from that position and put it into your structure S. So this is as simple as that. You have defined a structure. You internally put values into that component and write it. Or you read a particular set of bytes from the disk file, put it inside that structure. C++ will automatically interpret different components of that structure because so many bytes have come in scale as integer, floating point, text, or whatever, whatever. So once you have read these, all that you need to do is change test marks. First, I print the record. Then I change the test marks. S dot marks test number minus 1 is test marks. Remember, third test will mean 0, 1, 2 will be the index. Now I want to rewrite this. Please note that I will not rewrite only the test marks. I must read the complete structure. I must rewrite the complete structure, but not the whole file. So I have changed some components of the structure. Doesn't matter. The structure stands changed. I now seek the position for writing, seek P for put character. Which position? Obviously the same position. Because from where I read, I want to write. And I say my file dot write this. So this is a direct access. I read so many bytes into S. I modify S. I print if necessary. And then I rewrite it. After that, just to confirm that changes have happened in the file. After all, what I have written might have gone somewhere else. Just to confirm because I am writing this program for the first time, I will again read back the same record and print it. I have printed it before updation. I have printed it after updation. I will know whether any changes have happened. And the changes will be confirmed on the disk. At the end, I can close this file. In general, when I keep updating my records, every 5 days, 10 days, or 20 days, I would like to get a list of all updated records. What is the current status? Originally, I started with roll numbers, names, hostel numbers, and zero marks, and star star grades. At the end of the semester, I will have full of marks and appropriate grades there. So at any point in time, if I want to just print all the records in a file, I would like to sequentially read that file and print all the records. That is not very difficult. The rest of the program remains same. I open the file for input, but this time I can say, while not my file.eof. This is a very cute trick. .eof is a function of member function for the file, okay, which not my file eof will mean file has not ended. So as long as the file has not ended, observe that unlike in the earlier case where we were first reading n as the number of records and then reading so many records, such luxury will normally not be available to you. Because the number of records may increase or decrease depending upon how many students come in or go out. So you will generally not keep the number of records in the file. What you will do is you start reading the file. When the file ends, the records are finished. As many as you have read, that is the number of records in the file. So in general, you access the file by using end of file. And you check for end of file. What we are doing? We simply set db file pause to SNO into rec size. SNO we are set to 0 to begin with. And we keep increasing SNO by 1 inside this loop. All I do is I go to that seek g or seek get position at db file pause and my file dot read at this position as many characters as rec size. And I simply print that student's info. Because I know every time I'm going to get one structure full of student's information. Notice that the list of records in updated file will be like this. So you will notice that two changes were made perhaps. Let's say Ashank's marks in third quiz were, third test were changed and Vinita's marks in the first test were changed. 
So any update that will happen logically onto the file directly. The purpose of all this discussion was to ensure that you should be able to comfortably handle files of any size, no matter whether those files can fit inside your computer's memory or not. Because you have exactly the same facility as you have to access array elements. Even if you have a large array of one million elements, by giving a pointer, you can access an element value. An element could be integer, floating point, whatever. In exactly similar fashion, there could be a structure which is at the nth position in the file. If you know n, you can read that structure, you can write that structure. After reading, you can modify, rewrite. There is an additional mode which I have not discussed, which is called the append mode. In which case, if you have a file and you open it in the append mode, additional records get written at the end of that file. So file gets extended. That is quite useful when you are adding records, for example. There are many squiggers to file processing. In fact, there are advanced courses on database management and so on. Some of you will do those courses later. But for the purposes of this course, this much discussion is sufficient. We we'll stop today, but I will remind you that hopefully you have set the test questions. You remember last time I asked you to do that. Every lab batch has to submit three questions, one simple, one medium, and one complex type. One which will take 15 minutes to solve, another which will take 30 minutes to solve, and third which will take 45 minutes to solve. I am reminding you that that submission will have to be done. Those batches which don't submit this will lose marks because there are marks associated with this submission. Once again, the questions could be set by any one or two people teams, but at least three persons must attempt to solve that question in the stipulated time of either 15 minutes, 30 minutes, and 45 minutes. No names are essential, but there has to be a genuine effort, and that effort must be submitted as part of the submission. About the quiz assignment, I will make an announcement on Monday. Thank you.